Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this evening for this evening's CPD event. We're going to be chatting about endocrine disease um, with a particular focus on the care that we're going to give our patients with things like um, thyroid and adrenal disorders and diabetes. We're focusing especially on how the diseases work, the clinical signs that we see in these patients, as well as things like the diagnosis, treatment considerations, and nursing care considerations for patients with hyper and hypothyroidism, Cushing's and Addison's, and diabetes. And um, if anyone wants to grab a photo of uh, slides or anything like that throughout, please feel free. Also, if you want a copy of these at the end, just email um, the Ralph and we can send those to you. So if you want those, we can absolutely do those for you. So we'll begin this evening by looking at diabetes. And this is, I think, an important one for us to think about as nurses because really these patients benefit so much from nursing care, be that whether they present as an emergency in DKA or when we're just monitoring these patients and doing things like glucose curves in the hospital. And actually, when these patients come back for regular appointments, there's a lot of scope for us to do more with these patients at those visits as well. In order for us to do that, we have to understand how diabetes works. That's really important, and it's important that we understand the difference between canine and feline diabetes, because that's gonna change the advice that we give our clients, and it's gonna change the way that we nurse those patients in the hospital. So diabetes, we can define as an abnormal increase in circulating glucose levels. And that either happens because there's not enough insulin in the body or because the insulin that's in the body can't work effectively at its target sites. So it's the disorder, as we know, of the endocrine pancreas. So our pancreas has both exocrine functions, which are to do with the secretion of digestive enzymes, and endocrine functions. And these endocrine functions take place in four different types of cell. So we've got alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells and pancreatic polypeptide or PP cells. But the only two that we really care about that much are, uh, are alpha and beta cells. So alpha cells secrete glucagon and our beta cells secrete insulin. And that's what we're going to focus on particularly with diabetes, of course. So glucagon works to increase blood glucose in a hypoglycemic patient and our insulin, as we know, will decrease blood glucose in a hyperglycemic patient. So as we said, diabetes differs pretty significantly between dogs and cats in most circumstances. So if we look at canine diabetes, they have what we would consider to be type 1 diabetes in most cases. So this is where there has been a destruction or a deficiency of those beta cells in the pancreas that are responsible for secreting insulin. And that can happen for a few reasons. So it can happen due to things like pancreatitis, due to immune mediated destruction. And there's also a congenital form of diabetes that we can see in young patients where the beta cells in the pancreas actually don't develop properly. So we see a juvenile form of diabetes in some cases as well. So what does this mean for our patients? If they have a beta cell deficiency or there's been destruction of those beta cells, they don't have the ability to make any more insulin for life. So these patients have to have lifelong insulin therapy. There's no chance of them going into diabetic remission. And that's important that our clients are aware of that because that's going to change potentially their expectations for their pet. If we compare this to cats, up to about 80 to 90% of cats have got type 2 diabetes, essentially. This is where we've got a combination of failure of the beta cells to secrete insulin properly and insulin resistance. So unlike in dogs, we've got enough beta cells and they can secrete insulin, but just not very well. And any insulin that they are secreting isn't working as effectively in the body as it should be in a normal healthy patient. So this is important for us to bear in mind with cats because that is why we can get diabetic cats into remission if we manage them well enough and we get their glucose under control at a nice early stage. 
There are a few outlier cases in cats. So up to about 10 to 20% of cats have other specific causes for their diabetes. So these are certain diseases or medications. So uh, there's a condition called acromegaly, which is a growth hormone secreting tumour of the pituitary gland. And that causes insulin resistant diabetes as a result of the growth hormone. And there are certain medications such as glucocorticoids, so steroids, um, and progestin medications in cats that are also strongly associated with diabetes. And that's why we like to avoid long-term systemic steroid use in our feline patients. Cushing's, although it's very rare in cats, also is strongly associated with feline diabetes because they have too high levels of endogenous steroids. So we can see from this, actually, the advice we give our clients and the way that we manage these cases is going to differ pretty significantly depending on the type of diabetes that's at play. That being said, regardless of why that diabetes has happened, the net result is the same. We have a hyperglycemic patient because either there's not enough insulin or it's not working properly. And it's this hyperglycemia that causes the clinical signs that we see in our diabetic patients. So basically what happens is as the glucose level in the blood increases, it starts to cross the renal threshold, which is where we'll start to see it spill into the urine. And this happens at a blood glucose of around kind of 10 to 16, depending on the species. And when this glucose urea happens, that's when we start to see all of the clinical signs associated with it. The other thing that we need to bear in mind with diabetes is that hyperglycemia itself has a direct effect on the pancreas. So there's something called glucose toxicity that we see with elevated glucose levels. So these high glucose levels themselves will actually damage the endocrine pancreas, it will damage the beta cells. And this is really important to bear in mind for cats, because if you get your patient's blood glucose under control nice and quickly, you minimise the amount of time that this glucose toxicity can happen for, meaning you will reduce the amount of your pancreas that becomes permanently damaged. In cats, if enough pancreatic beta cells become damaged from glucose toxicity, they will become permanently diabetic and we will lose that kind of window where we can get them into remission. So that's why getting cats well controlled early is a priority if we're trying to get remission for these patients. So clinical signs in our diabetics. The most classic ones we're going to see are our combination of PUPD, polyphagia and weight loss. So polyuria happens because as glucose enters the urine, it makes it more concentrated. So the body will then start to lose more water in the urine to try and balance out that concentration and dilute it. So we get an increase in urine output because there's more water in our urine. The other thing that happens with that is our patients will then lose more water, so they become dehydrated, and so to compensate for that, they will drink more. So we get polydipsia as well. We also get this classic combination of polyphagia and weight loss in these patients. And that happens because one of the things that insulin does, in fact, one of the most important things that it does, is it allows glucose to go into the cells of the body to be used as an energy source. So if we don't have the insulin to do that, I always like to think of it as a key that like unlocks a door in the cell and allows the glucose to go in. If the glucose can't get into the cell, the body thinks it doesn't have enough energy so it starts to eat more because it's, the body's telling us, oh, we need to eat more to get more energy, so our cells have glucose, but we don't have the insulin to do anything with that glucose. So that's why, despite our patients eating more to get more energy in, they continue to lose weight. And then we'll see other clinical signs with these patients, such as diabetic cataracts in dogs. So Generally, all diabetic dogs will go on to develop cataracts at some point, assuming that they are kind of with us long enough for that to happen. But the, all diabetic dogs will ultimately end up with cataracts, and that's, again, something that our clients need to know about. And in cats, we can see things like a peripheral neuropathy, so that's where we'll get things like a plantigrade stance, where our cats walk with their hocks flat to the ground. So that's the clinical signs that we would expect to see in our diabetics. 
and now we look at diagnosis. So diagnosis of a kind of stable non-ketoacidotic diabetic is going to be based on the presence of persistent hyperglycemia and glucosuria. So persistently elevated blood glucose with glucosuria will confirm our diagnosis. It's important that that hyperglycemia is a consistent finding. So for cats, we'll often see quite kind of severe, acute, transient increases in glucose associated with stress, for example. So we have to be able to differentiate between the two. And the other thing that we can see on our biochemistry for our diabetic patients are changes to our electrolytes. So these are common in DKA cases, and we'll chat a bit more about DKA in a minute. But also these patients may sometimes be kind of anorexic, systemically unwell, especially with DKA. So immediately things like hypokalemia become a concern for these patients. So we know that with cats, we often will see stress hyperglycemia and that can make interpreting blood glucose challenging. So one of the things that we can do as another confirmatory test is fructosamine. So this is something that is super commonly performed. And essentially, fructosamine is a protein which is formed from glucose in the bloodstream. So it lasts for about two to three weeks in the circulation. And because of this, we can use it to kind of give us an average of what the patient's blood glucose has been over that two to three week period. So it's not affected by stress because those kind of acute spikes in glucose level are really nothing compared to that three weeks that that protein is kind of whizzing around the bloodstream for. And then urine analysis. So we know that we'll see glucosuria in our diabetic patients once that blood glucose level surpasses the renal threshold. We may also see things like ketone urea if you have a poorly controlled diabetic or a DKA case. The other thing that's worth bearing in mind with our urine analysis is that many of our diabetics can have subclinical urinary tract infections. And this is because the, bacteria, uh, the glucose in the urine is a great kind of food source essentially for bacteria. And generally the urine is more dilute because these patients are PUPD. So we, they are predisposed to um, UTIs. So we'll often make sure that we're doing a culture um, on our urine samples from our diabetics. Other tests that we might perform include things like blood gas analysis, especially if you're concerned about DKA, potentially a PLI if you want to have a look for something like an underlying pancreatitis that could be contributing to your patient's diabetes or making their diabetes harder to stabilise. And we may also consider doing things like an abdominal ultrasound so that we can have a look at the pancreas itself. <coughs> So once we've diagnosed our diabetic, we need to think about treatment. And again, this is going to kind of depend on whether you have a unstable ketoacidotic patient or you have a more kind of stable long-term diabetic. In general, for our non-ketoacidotic diabetics, our goal really is firstly, yes, to administer insulin because we know that that's important. But actually, we really want to hit the diabetes from like a multiple area. So we also want to look at diets. We want to look at any kind of contributing medications or conditions. And we want to look at the patient's weight. So we're going to provide a diet which reduces the demand on the pancreas to release insulin, maintain a healthy weight in our overweight or obese patients, because we know that obesity causes insulin resistance and remove any kind of underlying or contributing medications if we can and manage any contributing conditions. So looking at these in more detail, we'll start with insulin. There are four main types of insulin that we're going to use to manage our diabetic patients. And these depend on the species and also on how the patient presents. So we've got neutral insulin as our first option. This is really only used to manage DKA cases. And the reason for this is because it's a very kind of short term, short acting um, insulin that has a really rapid onset of action. So it works for up to four hours and it works quickly within half an hour after it's been given. So it's great for DKA, but you would have to be injecting a patient every four hours if you were going to try and use this as a long-term insulin. And that just doesn't work. 
So we then move on to can insulin or prozinc, and these are generally what we're going to be starting our non-ketoacidotic diabetics on. In general, we say can insulin is the one we go for for dogs, although prozinc is licensed for dogs as well, and prozinc is the one that we tend to prefer in cats as the first line. The reason for that is because caninsulin doesn't last quite as long in cats generally as it does in dogs. So um, it is an intermediate duration of um, insulin. It lasts around 12 hours in dogs, but anywhere from kind of eight to 10 hours in cats, but we still give it twice a day. So this means in cats, we have like a longer period where that glucose toxicity could happen, where the patient's not due their next injection yet, their insulin might not be kind of lasting long enough. Prozinc lasts longer, and that's why it's a better option generally for feline patients. So we tend to start our stable cat diabetics on Prozinc now rather than coninsulin, because we generally see better diabetic control with that. Prozinc is a more gradual release solution. So the Prozinc insulin kind of crystallizes under the skin, and then the insulin is released from that gradually. And then we have Glargine. So Glargine is probably our most infrequently used insulin. Annoyingly, it's also the best one for getting cats into remission. Um, but because it's off license, it's the one that we have to reach for last, frustratingly. So Glargine is actually an insulin analogue. It has a very, very long duration of action. And what we tend to see with Glargine is after about seven to 10 days of using it, our glucose curves will kind of flatten out and become a glucose kind of slightly wavy line rather than a curve. And this is great for cats because it means that we don't have those big peaks in glucose level morning and evening at the time that they would be due an injection, which means it's far, far better for keeping their glucose levels nice and stable. So better, therefore, for minimising glucose toxicity. So what we'll often do is start our caps, for example, on Prozinc, assess them, and if they're not stabilising well on that, we'll then switch them to Glargine and use that as their long-term insulin. Next up to think about for our diabetic patients is diet. So this is a really, really important consideration for them. And it's actually just as or slightly less important than insulin because the two really are going to work in tandem to help our patient. So I would still definitely advise your clients if you can to consider switching to a more appropriate diet for the management of their pet's diabetes. Our goal with our diabetics, diet-wise, is to minimise the impact of what they're eating on their blood glucose levels. And we do this mostly by manipulating the carbohydrate content within the diet. Because carbohydrates are broken down to sugars, and therefore those sugars are then broken down into glucose molecules, which requires insulin then for their processing. So for cats, again, the difference, uh, the, the dietary recommendations differ between cats and dogs. So for our feline patients, we generally feed them a low carbohydrate, high protein diet. And we ideally want the carbohydrate content to be less than 12% of the calories, essentially, or 12% of the metabolizable energy in the diet. Uh, cats can also be fed ad lib, so we don't need to worry too much in terms of the impact of when we feed them on their kind of injections and things. I'll make sure our cats are eating a bit at the time of their insulin injections, but if they want to graze throughout the day, that's absolutely fine and generally preferred. Our dogs, on the other hand, need to have a complete and balanced diet, which is higher in fibre and low in simple sugars. Unlike our cats, with dogs, the timing of their meal is more kind of closely associated with their direct kind of glycemic control. So what we, we tend to do with dogs, if they're on a twice daily insulin, is feed half their RER in the morning with their morning insulin and half their RER in the evening with their evening insulin. If they're on a once a day insulin, it's a little bit different, but most of our canine patients are on twice a day. And that's generally fine for most cases. So once we've got our patient on treatment, we also need to think about how we'll monitor them. And we really have three options. So we have glucose curves, fructosamine testing, as we've mentioned already, 
and then continuous glucose monitoring. So glucose curves, how many of you are doing glucose curves regularly in practice? Quite a few, yeah. So they can be really useful. They do give us a lot of information, but they definitely do have some limitations that we need to be aware of. And that's going to impact the way that we potentially manage these patients in the hospital. So, for example, if we have just changed a patient's insulin dose or switched them to a different insulin, we're going to need anywhere between three to seven days, depending on the species, for that level to kind of equilibrate, essentially, so that we can then get an accurate reflection of what that new dose is doing to their glycemic control. So for dogs, we generally prefer to wait about three days from changing their um, dose to curving them. And for cats, it can be up to seven. If you're using a longer lasting insulin like Glargine, we also don't need to take bloods from those patients really, really regularly because it has such a long duration of action, we generally don't see acute changes. So if you've got a patient on Glargine, you can do their bloods every four hours for a glucose curve instead of every one or two, and that's sufficient. We also know that stress plays a big factor in glycemic um, control in our patients in the hospital, especially for cats. And this can make getting accurate in-hospital blood glucose curves from feline patients really challenging. In addition, our glucose curves give us a probably 12 to maximum 24-hour window of what that patient's glycemic control looks like. But we know there's a lot of day-to-day -day variation so you could have a patient that curves and you get a certain set of results and then you go home and they could have relatively different results at home, but we're not able to measure them. So for that reason, we tend now to move more towards using continuous glucose monitors as a non-invasive and more patient friendly way of monitoring glucose levels. They also have the benefit that they give us a lot more information as well. So anyone using continuous glucose monitors in practice? Yes, perfect. So for those of you who aren't, these are sensors that are placed on the skin and they have a small probe on them that sits just underneath the skin and it measures the glucose in the interstitial fluid, essentially. And it will measure that continually for up to two weeks from that one sensor. And the client will scan the sensor a few times a day, either with a, a little reader that looks like a glucometer or with an app on their smartphone and they'll get up to two weeks of 24-hour graphs with their pet's blood gl uh, glucose curve on that are then sent digitally to us that we can have a look at remotely. So they cost generally about the same price as the glucose curve would do. They're about £50 cost to us to buy, but you get a lot more information and it means that your patient doesn't have to have ear pricks every one to two hours. So they're a really, really great option for um, these diabetics, especially the ones that get very stressed in the hospital. And then nursing considerations for our diabetics in the hospital, really most of our stable diabetics are gonna be here to see us for things like glucose curves for ongoing monitoring. So our focus really is on keeping their routine as consistent as we possibly can to minimize the amount of changes that we're making to, to the things like their insulin timing, their meal timings, and, and minimize any impact of this on their glycemic control. So we want to keep the timings as consistent as possible and match their normal routine at home as much as we can and then monitor their glucose appropriately. The other area that we really come into our own in the management of these patients is at home, which sounds counterintuitive because we're the nurses who are in the hospital and they're at home, but actually there's a lot that we can do to support our clients with managing these patients. So we want to make sure that we're talking to them about things like storage, handling and administration of insulin. And that is going to vary depending on the type of insulin that your patient's receiving, because the instructions on things like how to mix insulin differs across the types of insulin that you use. We also want to make sure that they know what to monitor at home. So things like food intake, water intake, activity levels, um, any general concerns, um, and also make sure that they know what to look out for for a hypoglycemic crisis and how to manage that. So we want to make sure they've got first aid advice for what to do if something happens. And also, the other thing I like to do with our clients is give them advice on what to do if 
there's like a common dosage issue. So the most common queries we get about insulin are, oh, my dog's only eaten half of their meal, what should I do with their insulin dose? Or, oh, my dog's not eaten anything this morning, what should I do? So I always like to make sure that our clients leave the hospital with instructions for what to do in those eventualities. So what to do if eating nothing, what to do if eating kind of half of their meal. Usually we say if they're eating kind of 50% or below, give half a dose. It, um, if they're eating none, then to kind of speak to us generally beforehand. But it really depends on the individual, um, individual patient and individual client. If they have a sensor on, our clients therefore have them the ability to measure their glucose level at home. So we normally would say, if they're not eating and it's less than 10 millimoles per litre, don't give any insulin. If they've eaten a bit and it's more than 10, give a half dose, that sort of thing. So that's our kind of non-ketoacidotic diabetics. But actually, the majority of the time that we see our sickest diabetic patients are when they come in as an emergency in DKA. So how are we going to manage those and why does DKA occur and how are we going to treat that? So DKA, as we know, is a serious complication of unregulated or decompensated diabetes. And what happens as a result of this is we get ketone bodies formed and metabolic acidosis occur. This happens because as the body goes for longer and longer periods without using glucose as an energy source, because the body lacks the insulin to do that, the body starts to look for alternatives and it goes to fats and it starts to break down lipids. And as a byproduct of this, ketones are formed in the liver from the breakdown of those fatty acids. And those ketones can then be used in the body as an alternative energy source when glucose is not available for use. And it's when this process of ketone formation and metabolism becomes unregulated that we see DKA as a result of this. There are three major ketones that uh, contribute to DKA. There are acetone, acetoacetate, and one called BHB, or beta-hydroxybutyrate. So two out of the three of these are acidic compounds. So we get lots of extra acid in the bloodstream as well as these ketones build up. And that's what causes the metabolic acidosis that we see in these patients. And one thing to bear in mind with DKA is we classically think that of it as something we see in our undiagnosed diabetics, where the signs initially of diabetes have perhaps been missed. But we also see it really commonly in established diabetics who've had some kind of problem at home with their diabetic control, or they've had something like a bout of pancreatitis, which has made the diabetes harder to stabilise. So it's not just something that we see in our undiagnosed cases. Clinical signs are going to be similar to our normal diabetics, so hyperglycemia is going to cause that osmotic diuresis and PUPD. But these patients are often also quite systemically unwell. They're going to have vomiting, probably some anorexia and lethargy. They'll get larger kind of volumes of fluid lost, and with that we also see electrolyte losses in these patients as well. So usually, by the time that they present to us, they're pretty significantly dehydrated, um, and needing quite intensive monitoring and management from us. The signs generally though can really vary from mild dehydration and a bit of PUPD all the way through to really severe changes in a collapsed patient that comes through the doors. So diagnosis of DKA is going to be pretty much the same diagnostic test that we've already done but technically to confirm a diagnosis of DKA we need three things. We need too much glucose, too much ketones and metabolic acidosis. So we really want to make sure if we have the ability to, we're doing things like a venous blood gas in these patients and monitoring ketone levels. So once we've diagnosed our DKA, we need to think about treating them. And this is gonna be our emergency management for these cases. So our goals really initially with DKA are to correct their fluid imbalances, so restore a normal circulating volume, reverse their metabolic acidosis, reduce their glucose and ketone levels, get rid of those ketones, and correct any other abnormalities that we might see. So the first way that we're gonna do this is with the administration of insulin. 
This is the main treatment that's going to get rid of those ketones that are accumulating and restore our normoglycemia. So we're going to give neutral insulin. This is the one that we want to use for DKAs because it's really quick duration and it's short acting. And we can either give it as a CRI, as you can see here, or as a intermittent IM injection protocol. The rate that we give it at depends on the patient's blood glucose levels. So we'll check the glucose levels every kind of hour generally, and then adjust the CRI rate according to their blood glucose level. And if your patient's glucose level returns to normal, but they still have ketones, we need to keep that insulin going because it's that insulin that's going to get rid of those ketones. So what we do then is we add a dextrose CRI on top so that we are preventing hypoglycemia but continuing the insulin until our patient's ketone negative. Fluid therapy and electrolyte supplementation are also really important aspects of managing DKA. So we know that our patients are often dehydrated on presentation with acid-base abnormalities, metabolic acidosis. So we really want to assess their hydration and perfusion status carefully and give an appropriate fluid therapy. This would usually be something like Hartman solution because it's going to help correct that acidosis because it's balanced. As we've already mentioned, electrolyte abnormalities are also common in these patients on presentation. If we don't see them at presentation, you can be pretty certain you'll see them once you start giving your patient insulin. And we know that often really quite marked hypokalemia occurs when we start neutral insulin treatment because that insulin takes potassium from the bloodstream and sends it into the cells, so reducing our circulating potassium level. So this means these patients often need quite a lot of potassium uh, supplementation in their fluid therapy and regular blood samples to check their electrolyte levels, sometimes often as, as kind of frequently as every six hours. And then on top of that, we have all of our supportive treatment. So this is going to be things like antiemetics. These patients often are vomiting or nauseous. So we want to be getting things like moropitant into them. If they're still nauseous despite moropitant, we can add in things like ondansetron on top. And analgesia, if you feel your patient's painful, get some good analgesia on board. DKA in itself isn't normally an especially painful condition, but if you have something like a pancreatitis that's upset your diabetic patient's pancreas and caused the DKA, they're going to have varying degrees of abdominal pain, especially in our canine patients. And then on top of that, there's a lot we want to monitor generally. So body weight, this is going to be imp important, not just in terms of nutritional status, but also to keep an eye on what we're doing with their hydration and our fluid therapy. Regular TPRs, pulse quality assessments, assessing respiratory pattern and efforts, hydration, perfusion status and blood pressure, for example. On top of all of this, we'll also be monitoring them closely for signs of things like fluid overload, or electrolyte abnormalities such as hypokalemia. And depending on how unstable your patient is at presentation, these parameters can change really quickly. So actually we want to be assessing them regularly, I would say at least every four to six hours, depending on how stable your individual patient is. And then we have nutrition. So nutrition, as we know, is a vital nursing consideration in basically every patient. But we know that our DKAs often are anorexic or have been vomiting prior to presentation. So make sure that you're calculating their RER and working out how much of that they are actually voluntarily consuming each day. If they have hyperexia for longer than kind of two to three days, or if you anticipate that they won't eat in the hospital, we need to be intervening. And really, this is going to be thinking about placing a feeding tube in these patients. Often, a nasoesophageal or nasogastric tube is sufficient. We can get liquid food down that, and that's fine for kind of short-term nutritional support in the hospital. If you're anaesthetising your patient for something like an abdominal ultrasound, you could potentially pop in an O-tube at the same time, especially if you think that your patient's going to go home on lots of medication or there's a risk that they may not eat at home because our clients can continue using those at home for feeding and medication. 
We can also be placing these tubes ourselves as nurses, so they're definitely a nursing skill that we can be utilising with these DKA cases. And we want to get assisted nutrition on board early with an appropriate diet. Generally, it doesn't matter too much. Um, in most of our patients, we'll use something like the recovery liquid for feline patients via the tube. For dogs, we'll use either the um, GI, recover, uh, GI or recovery. If they've got concurrent pancreatitis, we'll go for the low fat, something like that is fine. The other thing to think about for our DKAs is venous access and sampling. And this is really important because we know that our DKA cases need a lot of bloods. We're going to be doing really regular electrolytes, blood gases. We're going to be doing regular blood glucoses. And on top of this, they often need multiple medications, IV fluids and CRIs. So something like a central venous catheter, as you can see in the top here, or a peripherally inserted central catheter are really great options for these patients because not only can we use them to give fluids and medications, but we can also use them for blood sampling without needing venipuncture. So it's far more comfortable for these patients as well. Or we can place a continuous glucose monitor in the hospital for these patients and use that to measure uh, glucose levels. But be careful about doing that in a dehydrated patient because you're going to have less interstitial fluid there potentially for that sensor to pick up and measure. So you want to pop this on once you've corrected your patient's dehydration and you're happy with their kind of fluid balance. And then supportive care in the hospital. So keeping a close eye on these patients for ongoing pain, nausea, correcting that as we've said as required. Depending on how unwell your DKA is, if they're recumbent, that brings into it its own kind of nursing considerations as well with recumbency care. And then after all of that, you're going to have a standard diabetic patient that needs to go on to long-term management. So once they're persistently ketone negative and we've corrected their dehydration and acidosis and their electrolytes are normal, we're going to move that patient onto an appropriate long-acting insulin. Generally, can insulin for dogs, prosinc for cats. If they are not an already established diabetic, we then need to get involved at that point so that we can start educating our clients, supporting them at home, helping them with insulin injections, showing them what to monitor for and making sure that they feel well equipped to start doing all of the diabetic management at home when they leave the hospital. And as we've said, ongoing support is really, really important. So getting those patients in for follow-ups and making sure that as well as seeing the vet, they have the opportunity to touch base with the nurse, see if we can do anything in terms of nutritional support and talk to them about things like continuous glucose monitors if they're struggling or teaching them to do at-home curves, that sort of thing. These are all areas of big potential for us and they also really, really help our patients as well. <clears throat> so that is diabetes in a nutshell. And uh, we'll move on this evening now to thyroid disorders. So, <clears throat> whistle stop tour of these because there's not too much to write home about about thyroid disease in the hospital. So our thyroids, as we know, are paired glands that sit in our ventral neck. They sit either side of the trachea, as you can see here, and within them we have two different types of cell mainly. So we have our epithelial cells, which secrete thyroid hormones, and then around those we have um, something called parafollicular cells, and they secrete something called calcitonin, which drops our calcium levels. But we care really about those epithelial cells secreting those thyroid hormones, because that is what we see with hyper and hypothyroidism. So these thyroid hormones, so T3 and T4, are secreted and they're formed by the thyroid glands from iodine within the diet. And they're responsible for a wide variety of different things, including regulating growth and metabolic rates, which are the two kind of main focuses. But they're also involved with kind of bone, muscle function, GI health, brain development, cardiac function, all sorts of things. So hyperthyroidism in our feline patients is defined as the excessive secretion of thyroid hormones, which causes an increase in the body's metabolic rate. This is because of one or more uh, mass lesions within the thyroids. So we'll have either a benign or a malignant tumour of either one or both thyroid glands releasing excessive thyroid hormone. 
Most cases, thankfully, are benign, so an adenoma on the thyroid gland, but we do get up to 3% of cases that are a carcinoma, so a malignant tumour. Around 40% of cats will have both uh, thyroid glands affected. And the other thing that we often see with cats is ectopic thyroid tissue in other locations, such as the mediastinum, so within the chest. And this is important for us to consider because actually if we were to do a thyroidectomy bilaterally in a patient with hyperthyroidism and they have ectopic thyroid tissue, they could still be hyperthyroid. So that wouldn't be an appropriate kind of management strategy for those cases. So what signs do we see in a patient with too much thyroid hormone? Well, they are mostly related to that increase in our patient's metabolic rate. So their metabolism is kind of in overdrive, essentially. And this causes a few things. We get too much energy being used, so they have a higher energy expenditure. Their sympathetic nervous system tone also increases. And the other thing that increases is the blood flow through their kidneys, causing an increase in their glomerular filtration rate. So we see various changes, including kind of PUPD, polyphagia and weight loss, poor muscle and body condition, GI signs, uh, dermatological changes. So these patients can often look quite kind of unkempt. And we see those classic behavior changes that we think of in our hyperthyroid patients. They often get a bit kind of irritated. They'll have a short fuse. They'll be quite nervous and can be quite challenging to manage in the hospital. <clears throat> Although we classically think of our hyperthyroid cats as being those kind of polyphagic, face in the bowl, straight away kind of patients, that up to about 15% of them will have something called apathetic hyperthyroidism, where they'll actually be anorexic instead of polyphagic. And in those patients, they'll have even worse kind of nutritional and body condition status because their metabolism is still going crazy but they're not eating enough calories um, to kind of meet those needs. If we examine these patients, you'll often feel a goiter. So you'll feel a thyroid nodule. If you run your thumb and finger down the neck like this, you'll feel the thyroid slip out from underneath your thumb and finger. They're also often tachycardic and we may see things like a murmur or a gallop when we auscultate these patients. And they'll have evidence of weight loss with poor body and muscle condition scores. We know that hyperthyroidism is also quite closely linked with systemic hypertension, so we can see signs of target organ damage in these cases, and generally, most commonly, that's going to be the retinas. Either we can see kind of tortuous vessels and abnormalities within the retina under fundic exam, or in severe cases, complete retinal detachment. So diagnostics for our hyperthyroid patients, really we're gonna be doing our general blood work. So biochemistry, hematology, potentially a urine analysis as well. And ideally a blood pressure measurement because we know that these patients are hypertensive in many cases. Thyroid testing is gonna be the main kind of bulk of our diagnostics here. So we're gonna be measuring our total T4 levels but actually these are not always completely accurate. So if we're concerned that we've got a normal T4 level in a patient that looks very clearly like they are hyperthyroid, then we'll back that up by doing a free T4 measurement. That's a slightly more specific test. So that gives us less kind of false negative results. And if we are seeing cardiac changes on auscultation, we might consider doing an echo or at least kind of a point of care echo of the chest to look at the left atrial sizes. Um, and we want to look for kind of changes associated with that heart murmur and see why that could be happening and make sure there's not kind of structural cardiac disease there. And then we're on to treatment. And in most cases, we're going to be going for medical management but we do have the option to consider surgical management or radioactive iodine. So with medical management, we are giving either methimazole, which is filimazole or thyronorm, or carbimazole, which is Vidalta. And these drugs inhibit the synthesis of thyroid hormones. So they help to kind of stop those excessive amounts of thyroid hormones being created. If you have a patient that is going to go and have radioactive iodine or going to have a thyroidectomy, it's still advisable to pre-treat them medically first for at least kind of six weeks or so, and then reassess them 
because when we start treating the hypothyroidism, we can do things like unmask underlying renal disease because the tachycardia and the high blood pressure that the hypothyroidism causes is helping to preserve that renal function by forcing more blood through the kidney. When we treat the hypothyroidism, that can go away, leaving our patient with an unmasked chronic kidney disease. So even if we're going for other treatment options, we ideally want to treat medically, reassess them, make sure there's no kidney disease, make sure they're stable and that they're a good kind of anaesthetic candidate for a thyroidectomy, for example. Speaking of thyroidectomies, this is the surgical removal of the thyroid glands. They generally have kind of fallen out of favour recently and we tend to now only do them so much for carcinomas rather than the um, benign tumours that we can kind of manage with other, other reasons, other, other methods. So we can do either unilateral or bilateral surgery if both glands are affected. But as we said, if there is ectopic thyroid tissue there, despite removing the thyroid glands, symptoms can persist in these patients. So they may still need medical management after a bilateral thyroidectomy. Generally, I would say if your, if your clients are going for a kind of permanent solution and they don't want to do long-term medical management, out of the two of these, we generally would prefer to go for radioactive iodine because it treats all of the um, thyroid tissue, including the ectopic thyroid tissue, and it's generally quite safe. And actually, most patients will do very, very well with just a single injection. So I131 is a radioactive isotope of iodine that's injected. And once it's been given to the patient, it concentrates in their thyroid tissue and it destroys that abnormal hyperfunctioning tissue. As we said, it's got a really good success rate. However, we do make our patients radioactive when they are given radioactive iodine and they will require generally up to about two weeks of isolation whilst that kind of radioactivity subsides and whilst the half-life of that I131 has been passed. And it's, it's quite challenging nursing-wise because, because of health and safety, you cannot have as much interaction or contact with those patients as you would like to. But after that period, that is generally kind of two weeks and then they can go home and live theoretically a normal life with no hypothyroidism anymore. Nursing considerations for these patients, really in the hospital, most hypothyroid cats are, are quite stable. They generally manage more on an outpatient basis. They might come in for something like a dental or another condition and have hypothyroidism, but in most cases, specific hypothyroid nursing is going to involve behavioural considerations, medication administration and monitoring, post-surgical care if you have a thyroidectomy patient, and then a few other kind of specific considerations. So behaviour, we know that these cats can be a bit more challenging than our, our normal kind of feline patients. So your cat friendly considerations are even more important in these patients. So make sure that we are doing careful handling, emlocrine, considering kind of pre-sampling gabapentin in really, um, really stressed patients, that sort of thing. Other things to think about, these cats are often seniors. And although, yes, we're talking about hyperthyroidism, it's likely that they're going to have some concurrent osteoarthritis, for example, that's going to make restraint for things like IV catheter placement or blood sampling more uncomfortable for them. So that's something we also want to bear in mind with these patients. In terms of medical treatment, we want to monitor for side effects of medications. They are relatively uncommon, but we'll often see things like vomiting and potentially some kind of dermatological changes with some thyroid medications. If you have got a thyroidectomy case, monitoring for hypocalcemia postoperatively is going to be our main kind of nursing consideration. We want to be checking calcium, ideally ionised calcium regularly. Um, as well as monitoring for signs of hypocalcemia like facial rubbing, itching, behavioural changes, uh, muscle tremors, that sort of thing. And on top of that, we have all of our normal post-surgical monitoring and care considerations, so uh, food intake, fluid intake, pain, that sort of thing. And then lastly, if we do have uh, hypertension-associated ocular changes, for example, we may have a blind cat in our hospital, and that's going to change the way that we manage them as well. So making sure things like their key resources are always in the same location in their kennel is really important 
so that they always know where to find their bed, food, water and litter tray. And you can do things like draw a map of where everything goes and stick it on the front of the kennel so that even with different nurses on shift, that patient's resources are always in the same place. So then we move on to hypothyroidism. So this is going to be the most common thyroid disorder we see in our dogs. And this is where we have an inadequate secretion of thyroid hormones, leading to a decrease in our patient's metabolic rate. So the majority of our hypothyroid dogs have primary hypothyroidism. So this is where there's a disorder that's affecting the thyroid gland itself, damaging that thyroid tissue and preventing it from releasing as much thyroid hormone as it should. So normally this is like immune mediated damage to the thyroid gland, for example. In rare cases, we can see a secondary hypothyroidism and this is because there's been something that's damaged the pituitary gland, affecting the ability to stimulate the thyroid gland to release um, thyroid hormones. So this is going to be something like um, an acromegaly cat, for example, we treat by removing the pituitary gland. That then takes away their ability to secrete thyroid stimulating hormone and makes them hypothyroid. But in most cases, it's this primary hypothyroidism that we're going to see. In dogs, there are a few at-risk breeds, although we can see it really in any breed. So Cocker Spaniels, Golden Retrievers, Daxies, Poodles and Sheepdogs, Old English Sheepdogs, are all predisposed actually to hypothyroidism. And in terms of the clinical signs that we see in these patients, because the metabolism is involved in basically everything in our bodies, the clinical signs that we can see include basically everything. So we can see anything from kind of lethargy and dull mentation. Find me a medical case that doesn't present with lethargy and dull mentation, honestly. So that's not going to make narrowing it down very easy. Weight gain, bradycardia, arrhythmias, weakness. We can see some neurological signs, so vestibular signs, seizures. Most commonly, we see these in combination with lethargy and weight gain. So dermatological changes in our hypothyroid patients are very, very frequently seen. Alopecia, dermatitis, coat changes, hyperpigmentation of the skin, all of those are seen very, very commonly. And then we can see a vast kind of variety of other things, including constipation or diarrhea, uh, anemia, coagulopathies, dry eye and corneal ulcers in these patients as well. They're usually very non-specific and helpfully also very, very gradual in onset. In terms of diagnostics, we're going to be doing biochemistry and haematology and then thyroid testing. So on biochemistry, usually we see um, lipemia, so increased cholesterol and triglycerides, even on a fasted sample. So when you're taking bloods from these guys, ideally always do it with them starved. We can see signs of non-thyroidal illness. So there are other illnesses like kidney disease or liver disease, for example, that will falsely drop our thyroid hormone levels. So we want to look for kind of other illnesses that might explain a low T4 result, essentially. We can see kind of minor changes to a haematology, like a little bit of anemia. If you've got skin disease where you've got some infection or inflammation, we could see some increases to our white cells, for example. And then we move on to our thyroid testing. And this is going to be a total T4 and a free T4, and also TSH, so thyroid stimulating hormone levels. Usually we would see a low T4, total T4, below the normal reference range. But if you have a patient that has some kind of other illness, the body will slow down their metabolism to try and deal with that. So you'll also get a low T4 with that. So to make sure that our patient is truly hypothyroid, we will run a free T4 and also a TSH level as well. And in a patient with primary hypothyroidism, you will see a normal or high TSH combined with a low free T4 and that is diagnostic for primary hypothyroidism. One thing to mention, collecting a thorough history from our clients at the time of diagnosis is absolutely vital because lots of illnesses, as we've said, can reduce T4 levels, so they can look like hypothyroidism on bloods, but also lots of medications, including steroids, non-steroidals, phenobarb, uh, frusamide, contrast agents, all of those things can also 
change our patient's T4 levels as well, interfering with our testing. So really important that we know whether our patient is on any of these meds, for example, at the time that we take the bloods. Treatment is really simple with these guys. We're just going to replace the thyroid hormone that they can no longer make. So we're going to give them a synthetic T4, which is levothyroxine, and there's a tablet or a liquid version. So find out what's going to be the best kind of fit for that individual patient, what's going to be the easiest to get into them reliably at home, and what they're going to be happiest taking. And then we can either prescribe Thyphoron or Leventa. And then we'll assess regularly for bloods to recheck kind of T4 levels and make sure our dose is appropriate. We normally do this within about four to eight weeks once we've started treatment or uh, that period again after a dosage change. And ideally with T4 bloods in our hypothyroid dogs, we wanna measure peak levels. So check them around four to six hours after the medication's given. So if you're seeing these patients for bloods, always double check exactly what time they had their medication and make sure you're booking that appointment for within that kind of four to six hour window where possible. So that's our thyroid disorders. And I'm gonna finish with my favorite disorders, which are um, our adrenal disorders. So lots of really great considerations for these, not just in, out of the hospital, but also in the hospital. So like a good Addisonian crisis is a fantastic use of our skills. Um, and they're really, really fun cases to manage as well. So before we start thinking about adrenal disorders, I'm gonna temporarily take you back to AMP for one slide and talk about the adrenal glands. So. The adrenal glands are paired glands that sit next to our kidney, as the name would suggest, ad to renal, so adrenal glands. And they're made up of three layers, essentially. So we have the outer capsule, which is this kind of yellow layer that you can see here. We have our cortex, which is this pink layer, and that's responsible for the release of steroids. And then we have the medulla, which is this blue layer in the middle, which clearly is not blue in an actual patient. Um, and that's responsible for releasing catecholamines. So it's, a neuro, it's made of neuroendocrine cells and that releases things like adrenaline, noradrenaline. So our fight or flight hormones all come from our adrenal medulla. Today though, we only really care about the adrenal cortex. And that cortex is made up of three layers, as you can see here. And across those three layers, it's responsible for releasing many hormones. But the two that we care about are cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid, and aldosterone, which is a mineralocorticoid. And when we have things like Cushing's or Addison's disease, it's disorders of the release of these hormones that cause the clinical signs in our patients. So what do cortisol and aldosterone do? Cortisol, firstly, is strongly, strongly re related to the stress response in the body. That's not just stress in terms of behavior, that's anything that puts kind of physiological stress on the body. So illness, anesthesia, anything like that is gonna impact, be impacted by cortisol. It's also responsible for metabolizing things like carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. It plays an important role in inflammation and immune function and maintaining blood pressure amongst many other things. Aldosterone, on the other hand, is primarily responsible for managing kind of fluid and electrolyte balance within our kidney. Specifically, what it does is it keeps sodium in the bloodstream, so it stops as much sodium being eliminated into the urine, and where sodium goes, fluid follows. So therefore, it keeps more fluid in as well. And it removes potassium, so it helps the kidney to eliminate potassium from the bloodstream into the urine for removal. And that is really important to think about with Addison's disease, because when we don't have enough aldosterone, this starts to become a really, really big problem. So Cushing's disease, or as it's now known, hypercortisolism or hyperadrenocorticism, but generally this is now the preferred term. Hypercortisolism is the excessive release of glucocorticoids or cortisol. There are two forms. So we have pituitary dependent disease and adrenal dependent disease. Out of these, pituitary dependent is the most common form. So up to kind of 85 to 90% of cases will have pituitary dependent Cushing's. This is where your patient has a benign mass on the pituitary gland, and that mass is releasing lots and lots of ACTH. 
So it's stimulating the, the adrenal glands all the time to release cortisol. That ACTH is bombarding the adrenal glands and telling them to release more and more and more cortisol. So what happens then is our adrenal glands are continually stimulated by this pituitary tumour and as a result they get big and they release lots of cortisol into our patient. Adrenal dependent Cushing's is the less common form. So we see that in about kind of 10 to 15% of cases and these patients actually have a mass on one of their adrenal glands that is releasing cortisol. And as the adrenal mass releases cortisol, the body starts to recognise, oh, I've got loads of cortisol in my bloodstream. This is great. I don't need any ACTH and I don't need to make any more cortisol. Please, let's stop that. So the pituitary gland shuts off any stimulation because it knows that it has enough cortisol in the, in the bloodstream, in the body. So then your normal adrenal gland with no tumour on it gets no stimulation whatsoever and essentially shrinks down and atrophies. So these patients with adrenal dependent disease have one tiny kind of barely functioning adrenal and then one lovely adrenal gland with a big tumour sitting on it. Thankfully though, this is the less common form that we see. The clinical signs that we see in our Cushingoid patients are going to be pretty similar across the two forms because it's the high cortisol levels that are causing kind of these signs. So regardless of the method, this is generally what you'll see. We see PUPD in these patients alongside polyphagia and weight gain. They have this kind of classic pot-bellied appearance and they'll often have kind of bilateral alopecia um, often on kind of the flank and ventral abdomen. They're also quite lethargic and we see often quite marked kind of skin and coat changes. These patients will have, as well as alopecia, often lots of kind of comedones, and they'll have very, very fragile skin. Now, we don't see Cushing's as often in cats. We can see it in feline patients. I think I've seen maybe one case. Um, the skin fragility in cats with Cushing's is insane. We have to be really, really careful with things like what tape we use, how we clip them, all the things, because we can really cause quite significant kind of tearing and, and damage to the skin. So be very, very careful um, generally with things like clipping, tape, that sort of thing with um, any Cushingoid patient. Diagnostics for these guys primarily are going to be based on bloods and urine analysis. So we'll do biochemistry and haematology. We can see things like increased ALP on our biochemistry really, really commonly in Cushing's disease. Urine analysis. On a normal kind of UA, we'll see things like a low USG and maybe some protein urea. We can also see a urinary tract infections in these guys because the steroid levels themselves can um, kind of cause immunosuppression because they're high and also the urine is often dilute. So these guys, again, are predisposed to UTIs. And then there are several adrenal tests that we're going to want to do, assessing the function of our adrenal glands. These are going to tell us, one, if our patient has Cushing's, and in some cases, the type of Cushing's that they have. So there are three main tests that we'll perform. The first one is a UCCR, which is a urine cortisol creatinine ratio. And this is a urine sample, essentially, that, that looks at the amount of cortisol versus creatinine present in the urine. This is a really great test to rule out Cushing's disease because if it's negative, you can be happy that your patient does not have excessive cortisol levels. But we also know that cortisol gets high when you're stressed, when you're excited. Um, so there are lots of things that can increase cortisol. So if you have a positive test, that doesn't necessarily mean your patient has Cushing's. It just means you need to do another test to confirm whether that you've got a definitively Cushingoid patient or not. So a negative UCCR rules out the disease. A positive one guides your kind of ACTH stim or low dose dex testing, essentially. So our ACTH stimulation test or our low dose dexamethasone suppression test are going to be our kind of tests to more definitively diagnose Cushing's disease. And of the two of those, a low dose dex is a bit more specific. And sometimes it can give us a bit of an indication as to the type of Cushing's that's present, whether it's pituitary or adrenal in origin. When we are seeing these patients in the hospital, it is usually because we're doing something like an ACTH stimulation test or a low-dose DEX. 
So a few things to bear in mind when we're sampling these patients to help you get an accurate result from them. Firstly, keeping them calm as much as possible is going to be really important, especially for something like a low-dose DEX, because we don't want to falsely alter those cortisol levels. Ideally, we also try and avoid performing these tests after recent anesthesia, sedation or procedures, because again, we want to minimise any impact on cortisol levels. When we're collecting urine samples for a cortisol creatinine ratio, ideally you don't want to be running that test on a sample you've collected in the hospital, because if your patient is stressed, you're going to increase the amount of cortisol in that urine. So get your carers or your clients to collect a sample at home when the patient is nice and calm and bring that into the clinic for us to send off for a UCCR. But really avoid kind of any in-hospital samples sent off for UCCR. One thing to bear in mind is there are some reports as well that lipemia can affect cortisol results. It is at the moment of kind of questionable clinical significance. So some clinicians will say fast for a ACTH stim test sample, for example, and some won't. So just double check um, for individual preference. But there are some reports, but it's really kind of not made a significant difference um, in terms of kind of clinical studies that we have so far. The other thing we need to make sure we do is make sure no steroid medications have been given within the last kind of four to six weeks. I check even things like topical or inhaled versions potentially as well and the type of steroids that have um, been given because these can interfere with ACTH stim test results. So just get a thorough history about the meds that have been given in the last kind of couple of months leading up to the test. And then the last condition to look at this evening is my absolute favourite one, which is Addison's disease or hypoadrenocorticism. And I find these cases both really, really fun and often really quite scary in equal measure. But I think the scariness is probably what makes it fun um, as well on some level. So Addison's disease or hypoadrenocorticism is also known as the great pretender. The reason for that is because it loves to basically pretend to be any other medical condition that you can think of and um, does not like being kind of shown up to be Addison's disease. It is a failure of the adrenal cortex to create steroids. So those layers of our adrenal cortex aren't working well enough. They're not releasing cortisol and or potentially aldosterone. So we get this glucocorticoid alone or glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid deficiency. Usually, in most cases, it's because the immune system has helpfully come along and started destroying those layers of the adrenal cortex. But we can also see it due to idiopathic reasons, um, due to damage to the pituitary gland, because then our patients have no ACTH, so their adrenal glands aren't stimulated to release cortisol. And we can also cause it by suddenly discontinuing long-term steroids or high-dose steroid medications. So that's why we talk to our clients about gradually withdrawing or weaning off of steroids to prevent this from happening. So what happens when our patient becomes Addisonian? Usually, the first thing that happens is cortisol release from the adrenal gland drops. So the layers that release cortisol start to become destroyed. Sometimes this will be the only hormone change that happens and these patients will have what we call atypical Addison's disease. What happens more frequently is that in addition to cortisol release stopping, aldosterone release starts to stop as well. And that is what we call typical Addison's disease and it's when this happens that you get a patient in an Addisonian crisis. In terms of when we see Addison's disease, it is usually in young to kind of middle-aged dogs, conversely to things like Cushing's that are more um, conditions of senior dogs. Female dogs are also slightly overrepresented, and there are a few at-risk breeds, particularly including standard poodles, uh, Nova Scotia, doctoral retrievers, and Portuguese water dogs. But we can actually see this really in, in any breed. So clinical signs. Helpfully, to begin with, the clinical signs that we see with Addison's disease are diarrhea and vomiting, dehydration, lethargy, anorexia, abdominal pain. If I see those, I'm not necessarily, well, maybe I will now because I love Addison so much, but 
normally my brain would not immediately go, this is an Addisonian patient. My brain would go to pretty much any other condition, GI disease, chronic kidney disease, blah, blah, blah. So really, this is why we call it the great pretender, because it loves to sit there and pretend to be gastrointestinal disease predominantly. These signs here, these non-specific, really helpful clinical signs are associated with cortisol loss because cortisol is required to maintain a normal, healthy, functioning GI tract. Usually, what you'll see happen is your patient will come in and out and they'll have GI signs that kind of don't really go away, but maybe respond a bit to symptomatic treatment, but they never completely resolve and they'll be in and out of the hospital every now and then. And then one day, boom, they'll come in in an Addisonian crisis. And the Addisonian crisis happens because of that aldosterone loss. So when our patients lose aldosterone, their fluid and electrolyte balance goes essentially out the window. So as we said, aldosterone is responsible for maintaining a normal sodium to potassium ratio. And as it cons uh, conserves sodium, it also retains fluid and helps us keep a normal circulating volume. So when that's low, we have a patient that has low sodium, high potassium, and often quite significant dehydration and or hypovolemia. And with that hyperkalemia, we see direct effects on the heart from that because most of our potassium likes to sit in our muscle cells. And these patients will come in with bradycardia and cardiac arrhythmias. And it's that that makes an Addisonian crisis a life-threatening emergency requiring immediate stabilization. So when we run bloods on these patients, we may have beautifully normal electrolytes. We may have very, very obvious hyponatremia and hyperkalemia, as you can see um, in these bloods here. So these are a set of biochemistry results from a pug that came into us in an Addisonian crisis. And you can see we've got a sodium here of 131 and a potassium of 8.5. So that's quite classic for what you'd see in an Addisonian crisis. And if we look at the ratio between uh, sodium and potassium, it's 15. And anything less than 27 should immediately increase your suspicion for Addison's. You can also see a number of other changes to your biochemistry, including azotemia, so increased renal parameters. Hypoglycemia is also common in these cases. Um, and we can get hypercalcemia as well. So often, these patients will come in for something like an AKI or on bloods they'll look like an AKI because they're azotemic with high potassium but actually their kidneys are fine it's just that they are Addisonian. On haematology a normal haematology in these patients can actually be abnormal. So there's a phenomenon that happens on our haematology called a stress leukogram or a steroid leukogram which is where we see changes to our white blood cells because of cortisol. And in the stressed patient that has normal adrenal function, that would be a completely normal finding. We would write that off as stress and kind of disregard it. If you have a patient here who is unwell and stressed when they come into the hospital, as most patients who are emergencies are, you'd expect maybe to see a stress leukogram on their haematology. But if they don't have the cortisol to actually make that, you'll get a normal haematology, but that's actually an abnormal finding. So when these guys are completely normal haematology with a set of biochemistry that looks like this would further increase our suspicion for Addison's disease. Then we need to think about actually diagnosing the patient's Addison's disease. And we're going to do this by doing, in most cases, an ACTH stimulation test. You can just look at cortisol levels, so basal cortisol, but they're really only a screening test to increase your suspicion, they don't definitively diagnose um, the disease. So in our chronic GI patients that come into us, for example, we'll always run a basal cortisol, and if it's normal, we'll be happy that they, they don't have Addison's. But if it comes back low, we'll do an ACTH stimulation test just to definitely rule it out before going on with a, a GI workup, for example. So our ACTH stim is what's going to be needed to rule in or out Addison's disease. And when we do an ACTH in an Addisonian patient, 
we'll see a complete failure to stimulate. So both the pre and post ACTH samples will be low. One really, really important thing to think about in these cases, don't give any prednisolone or hydrocortisone um, to these patients prior to doing an ACTH stimulation test because it will impact your results. If you absolutely have to give steroids to these patients in an emergency, before you've finished your ACTH stim test, you can give them dexamethasone and it won't cross-react. However, in most cases, giving them in an immediate dose of steroid isn't going to make a, a life or death kind of difference. In that first hour, we're going to be prioritising fluid balance, correcting their hyperkalemia, um, preventing hypovolemia, correcting hypoglycemia if we see it, and doing an ACTH stimulation test. Our first hour is normally going to be spent stabilising our patient, and then once we've pulled that post-ACTH sample, then we'll get a dose of steroid into them, potentially. So, how are we going to stabilise our Addisonian crisis patient? As we've said, it's a life-threatening condition requiring immediate stabilisation, so we know that we need to act quickly with these patients. And really, our goals are going to be correcting hypovolemia, and correcting hypoglycemia and electrolyte abnormalities. So these patients, if they're hypovolemic on presentation, will need um, volume resuscitation, so giving appropriate fluid bonuses, usually up to about 10 mil per kilo over 10 minutes or so, depending on the individual patient, and we'll reassess that patient um, after that bolus has been completed to recheck their cardiovascular status and then repeat that as necessary until those parameters normalise. Hyperkalemia, we're going to correct in a variety of different ways, depending on the kind of severity of the hyperkalemia that you're seeing. So firstly, fluid therapy. So the fluids that we're giving will help to dilute that potassium to a point. We'll also give our patients some calcium gluconate. That's going to protect the heart from the potassium, but it's not necessarily going to drop the potassium levels itself. To drop the potassium levels, we're going to give either glucose or glucose and neutral insulin to our patient. And that is going to help to move that high potassium from the bloodstream into the cells and get it out of the bloodstream where it's going to cause less um, kind of severe effects to our patients. So those are kind of the first things you want to be doing. If your patient is hypoglycemic on presentation, we also want to treat that um, with potentially boluses, plus minus a CRI um, of glucose if you have got a patient with sustained hypoglycemia. And we also want to correct hyponatremia in these patients. So we know that they present in a crisis with quite marked um, reductions in sodium level. It's really, really important when we're correcting sodium to do it slowly. So the maximum rate of correction is going to be about 0.5 millimole per kilo per hour. And that's important because if we correct, um, we know when we change sodium levels, we also change fluid levels in the body, essentially. So if we give sodium too quickly, we're going to start seeing shifting of fluid from kind of different body compartments and um, causing um, quite significant complications for our patients. So maximum rate of correction is 0.5 millimole per kilo per hour for, um, for these patients. On top of that, we also need to think about monitoring and nursing care. So if this patient's coming into our hospital, we're going to be under the direction of the vet, giving boluses, giving medications to manage their hypoglycemia and hyperkalemia. I'm going to be keeping a really close eye on cardiovascular status as well. So pop them on an ECG if they're hyperkalemic. Look for abnormalities that you'll see there. Doing regular rate and rhythm checks, blood pressure checks if they're hypovolemic especially as well. And then, as we've said, pull samples for your ACTH stimulation test before, um, ideally before giving steroids to these patients. So once we've stabilised our Addisonian crisis patient, we then have a normal Addisonian patient that needs lifelong care. And again, this is another area where I think we can really come into our own as nurses with caring for these patients. We have an Addisonian that... Um, it no longer comes to see us, they're under the care completely of their referring vet now. But after their crisis, I'd say 90% of their appointments after their initial hospitalisation were with our medicine nurses. 
actually showing really just how much we can do in the long-term management of these cases. And it was us talking to the clients, us supporting them, us teaching them how to inject, us taking the bloods, all of those things. So we really can do a lot in the day-to-day -day kind of and ongoing management of these cases. So once we've stabilised our crisis patient, we need to replace the steroids that their adrenal glands can't make. And we're going to do that with a combination of glucocorticoids, so we're going to give PRED to replace the cortisol, and that's going to be given at a low dose orally once a day, just to replace the normal amount that the body should be making but can't. And to replace their aldosterone, we're going to give them Zycortal or DOCP injections. And this is given every kind of 25 to 28 days. We usually go with every 28 days um, for our patients. And that is initially given in the hospital with lots of kind of regular bloods from monitoring. But actually, we can be getting um, people to do this at home um, after a while, once we're happy that the um, Addison's disease has stabilised and the patient is on a stable dose. We also need to monitor the response to treatment, and we do this in two ways, depending on the medication. So with our PRED, we monitor that based on clinical history, on how the patient's doing, asking if we're seeing PUPD, polyphagia, panting, anything like that, asking if we're seeing GI signs, and essentially adjusting the dose of PRED as necessary to make sure that we're just meeting that kind of physiological dose. And with our Zycortal, or our DOCP, because this is replacing aldosterone, we're gonna monitor electrolytes regularly in these patients. Usually we'll start by doing that 10 days after each, in each injection, and then every four weeks, so the day that the injection is due. And then ultimately we will reduce um, those down to every three to six months then um, for the rest of the patient's life. Last thing to think about, nursing considerations for our Addisonian patients. In the hospital, they need a lot of monitoring. So keeping a really close eye on cardiovascular status, pain, vomiting, diarrhea. We know that these guys often have GI signs and abdominal pain um, on presentation. ECG if they're hyperkalemic and keeping a close eye on things like blood glucose and electrolytes. Hydration monitoring is also really important. So we know that these patients often present with dehydration and or hypovolemia. So keep a close eye on hydration and perfusion status and adjust their fluid therapy rates appropriately. Nutrition is another important consideration. So anorexia and GI signs again are common in these patients. So we want to be calculating their RER, tracking the amount that's being consumed and intervening where necessary. And then our long-term care for these patients is all aimed at monitoring, looking for side effects for excessive prednisolone doses. But also another really important thing is managing stress. And that's not just stress in the home or behaviourally, that's also illness, anaesthesia, anything like that. So for example, if there is an acute stressor coming up at home, or if the patient is unwell, we need to increase the amount of PRED that that patient is having, because normally the body would be able to make more cortisol to cope with that acute period of stress. So we usually say double the dose of PRED in times of illness um, or stress in these patients. So that is our kind of whistle-stop tour of the endocrine system and the main endocrine diseases that we see. I'm, I'm so grateful for your, for your attention this evening, so thank you so much for being here. Um, just to sum up everything that we've discussed this evening, we know that we as nurses are really, really heavily involved in caring for endocrine disease patients. They are some of the most common cases that we see, and they're really some of the cases that we can do so much with um, to make a big difference with as nurses. In order to do this, it's really important that we understand how the different endocrine diseases affect our patients and the signs that we see and how they differ between cats and dogs so that we can make sure that we are providing the appropriate monitoring tailored to the individual and giving the right advice as well. Our role includes not just the long-term care, but also triage and stabilisation of our emergencies, so our crisis patients and our DKAs through then all the way to inpatient care, diagnostics, and then long-term follow-up. And there's lots of advanced nursing skills that we can use with these cases, such as PIC lines, placing central lines, using continuous glucose monitors, placing feeding tubes, and lots of advanced monitoring techniques.
And lastly, our care, especially the nursing care of our endocrine patients, should continue long term. Our responsibility to these patients doesn't end when they leave the hospital. Really, there's a lot more that we can be doing for um, long term support for them as well. Um, so thank you so much again for your attention. I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you.